Welcome to New Life Bible Church, and thank you for joining us. Every week, listen to practical teaching of God's Word you can apply to your life as you live out your faith every day. Our vision at New Life is that you may know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Here's this week's message from New Life Bible Church. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, 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 I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I thank you for your word, Father. I pray that it would happen as the time that Peter spoke your word, that the Holy Spirit came upon those that heard it, Father, and it changed their minds, their hearts, Lord, and it caused them, Lord, to be doers of the word and not just hearers, Father. I pray that you would anoint every word that comes out of my mouth, Lord, that you would use me as a tool in your hand, Lord. To, to minister this very difficult uh, a word, Father, but for you, it's simple. So, Lord, I pray that we would receive it that way, that we would receive it in love, and that it would change our minds and our hearts, and it would cleanse us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. amen. So today is called Stand, and uh, we're going to be talking some politics and I've always said from the pulpit, I don't, and I'm not, believe, I'm not going one side or the other. I'm not going to mention names. Uh, I want to give you a disclaimer. I'm not going to mention names, even though at some point you may hear me say something that somewhat describes uh, some of those that are running for either president or senator or governor. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that I'm choosing that person, okay? What I want to teach you to do is to choose the, the government leaders that are going to uh, 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 protect our biblical uh, lie, our biblical way of living, right, in our own convictions. So that's all I'm going to do here today. Now, I'm going to say some things that are going to sound very absolute, like I'm going to say something, and then you might disagree with what I'm saying. What I'm asking you to do is wait to the end, okay, because there's going to be things that I'm going to say that are going to sound very black and white, and then as we get towards the end, it's going to leave it up to you to make that decision. I'm just helping you make that decision. I've always said, uh, uh, vote your convictions. Whatever you do, vote. I don't care what side you're voting on, vote. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with that, with a, with a quote. But whatever you do, just vote. It's, it's a sad thing to say that only 50% of Christians in the United States actually vote. 50%. Can you imagine if every single church-going person, I'm talking Catholic, Methodist, I'm talking every denomination that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, part of the Trinity, born of a virgin, uh, you know, uh, died on a cross, resurrected three days later, ascended unto heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father and intercede for us, right? Come on. The Holy Spirit was... Those are basic principles that many denominations that, that are considered Christian believe. That's all Christian is. I have a real dear friend of mine. He's a Methodist pastor, and he says, I'm not a Methodist. And he pastors a church in Jacksonville, a very nice church. And uh, uh, he used to be my boss here at, at Halifax Urban Ministries. And he, he pastors, he goes, I'm not a Methodist. I'm a Christian that goes to a Methodist church. Because right. right. being Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, that doesn't, that's not getting you into heaven. Right. And that's not going to help you change the world around you. Right? Being a believer of what God did for us and accepting Jesus into our hearts and starting a brand new life in freedom is what's going to help us affect the, the area around us. And we have a, a responsibility as a church in this area. So please listen to it in its entirety. Those that are listening online uh, have the best way of, you know, I think people like listening and waiting because they can just hit the button and I'm off. Right? Boom. And, and turn to, I'll go find me a preacher I like. <laughs> Come on, you can go to YouTube University or YouTube Church and find any type of preach. If you want something that more, you know, on Sunday morning or Tuesday night or whatever, you can go there, boom, hit a button and get rid of the one you don't like and go find one you do like. Yeah. It's that simple because we have itching ears. But sometimes the Lord wants to speak to the church. And this word is being spoken over the church in different ways across our nation. So I found that it's my responsibility as your pastor to help you vote. 
We cannot continue to allow our nation to head in the direction that it's going. Okay? That does not mean that we stand against anything. It means that we stand for something. Okay? And I'm going to explain that in just a minute. So today is stand. Okay? So uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. I'm, I'm going to go pretty quick, and you're going to hear me uh, stop and read some things because I've, pu- I've put my thoughts in writing so that it will help me kind of stay on track. <laughs> Let's hope that that works today. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel one standing firm in one spirit will cause us to stand as one as a nation with certain beliefs that will uh, will rise up and cause the nation to change its way of thinking now granted we're not completely lost I'm still standing here. We're still preaching, right? We're still preaching the gospel out there. There's still hope. You know, I I teach that hope is the anchor of our faith, right? And then I always teach that that anchor has a rope. And depending how long that rope is, right, is how long you got to pull to get back to your hope. Sometimes the anchor's right there, and you're like, okay, my anchor's good. But sometimes the rope is, that rope is getting longer and longer in our nation. Our hope is getting farther and farther away. We need to start pulling ourselves yes. back towards the anchor of hope, right? Yes. We need to get back to where we're going. So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be on alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. You know, I have a, a teaching, too, that I learned from Pastor Fred. It says, make a peep. Make a sound. It says that the, the bird or, or the, you know, the bird was, had its eggs in its, in its basket and the enemy came, the snake came to take the eggs out of it, and the bird didn't make a peep. Didn't make a sound. We let the snake come in and take the eggs. It's time that we stand up, if not for us, for the next generation, yes. for our children. Okay. We need to make a peep. We need to make a sound. Right? We're losing our kids. Well, we're losing. No, no. We need to quit blaming and start taking responsibility, right? Yes. I'm going to say a phrase here. This is mine. And if you take it as an offense, then don't put my name on it. So... Do not choose the lining of your pockets over the convictions of your heart. Some of you know exactly what that means, right? You've been around long enough to know that during this time, right before a presidential election, whoever's in presidency or whoever, they they try to line your pockets. They're buying your vote. Listen, I'm not speaking ill. I'm just saying this is how what politics has become. Lord, help me. Politics should be about promoting what you believe and what you're going to do. Politics has turned into how I can make that person look bad. How I can bash that person. How I can, I can speak that person in a derogatory sense that will cause everybody to hate them. That doesn't tell me anything about the person that we're trying to put in there. I want to know what you're going to do. And how you're going to do it. And if you're going to uh, pass laws and and have things in place that are going to go with my convictions. Listen, you said we're losing and the kids in the school are learning this and now they're pushing this and pushing the other. Would you today give back every tax cut and every check for your children? Remember those? We'll give you $600 per child. Come on. Right? If you could give all that back. To turn our society back to a place where you could trust your kids in a public school. Would you do that? Come on. Right? Don't let them line your pockets. Forget about that. God's my provider. I live in the kingdom. In the kingdom, there's always provision. Right? Kingdom provision. It's not about the economy. It's about what my God's going to take. That has nothing to do. the, The money part has nothing to do with your convictions and voting your conviction. So separate the two, right? Be on alert. Stand firm in faith. Act like men. Be strong, right? Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. What do we do? We stand firm 
in our political views. We stand firm on this side or that side, the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans. And, the you know, we stand firm on those ends. Listen, politics, all it does is divide. They're divided amongst themselves. The Republicans are divided amongst themselves. I don't want anything to do with any of that. That doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility as Christians and as a church in this nation to do something to turn things back around. Come on. We can do it. We can do it. I'm going to show you how in just a minute. So as the elections are getting closer, I would like to help you vote your convictions by planting and or strengthening your convictions as born-again Christians. So I've been saying that. Vote your convictions. Vote your convictions. And the Holy Spirit just touched me so strongly and said, give them some convictions. Right? Right. And I'm, you know, I think that you guys know already, and most most of you do. But sometimes you stand on something, and it's not; it doesn't have four legs. In in Bible school, they teach you anything that you teach should have four legs. You should have a New Testament scripture, an Old Testament scripture, something that corresponds. You should have four legs that help you stand on a word, because you know, three legs you're not as good, two legs you're less, and one leg you're falling over. Right? Right. So you want to have you want to have something to put your convictions on sink your teeth into first of all as christians we are to stand for something not against something understand this and hear this as we stand for protecting the life of an unborn child by being pro-life it is insinuated that we are against abortion and we are right we support our pregnancy centers and okay so we are we understand that but we stand for life Because the minute that you stand against something, then we behave in a way that is not godly. Listen to me. In the 90s, I'm going to do a little bit of history all the way back to 1980 when I wasn't even old enough to vote at the time, but um, uh, in, in history, right? So in the 90s, it was, the, the church was on the streets, man. We were holding signs. I remember holding signs. Remember? We were holding signs up against abortion and, and, and you know, you're killing babies and we're saying all these things. And, and yes, we, our motive was right. We were doing the right thing. But then some of these people started blowing up abortion clinics yes. and and snipers in Miami were setting up and shooting people yeah. from highways and stuff that were going into in doctors that they knew. That is not our belief. No. That is not. And they represented the Christian church no. on our behalf. So what did we become? We became haters of people. We don't hate. God loves people. God loves that abortion doctor. Yes, he does. He, does. he wants to see that man give his or woman give their life to the Lord. There's an opportunity for that person to be saved. Now, what they're doing is against what we believe, but then we should stand for life. See, the gospel doesn't stand against anything. It stands for something, and it allows people to make the choice. And listen, the gospel is sweet. Taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And it is the goodness of God that leads people to repentance, right? It's not the fire from hell. Right? It's the goodness of God. It's love. That's how I got saved. Someone told me God loved me, and I finally believed him. We stand for marriage between a man and a woman, which means we do not agree or believe in same-sex marriage. I'm allowed to say that even into the camera. This is going to go on YouTube. and I'm allowed to say that because we had to, uh, Rama had to hire lawyers to, we're an affiliation of Rama. We're not just a Rama church. They stopped doing that in 1990. And uh, thank the Lord that when I took over here, uh, the director was friends with my dad. And, you know, it's who you know, right? I should, probably shouldn't have said that. But anyway, <laughs> they, allowed us, they allowed us to keep our affiliation. So for, for us, you know, we pay for that every year. It's not much. Uh, we pay for our affiliation to keep it. And they provide for us some covering. And in that covering, we have accountants and we have lawyers that oversee uh, all the affiliated churches. So we uh, sent in our bylaws to them and they... Uh, added an amendment to those bylaws, which allows me to say what I just said. Can you imagine that? Right? It allows me to be able to say what I just said. But listen, we are not against the people who are practicing things that don't follow our convictions. We're not against those people. In fact, I'm going to take another step further and say, those people are welcome to come here. We've had those people sitting here. We had one couple for six months. The other couple didn't last very long. 
but one couple of same sex were sitting here for six months. Now, they knew what we believed. They asked me. I used to stand at the door when people left, and I would shake hands, and they came. Do you believe that? I said, listen, I'm not God. I'm, a, I'm not God. I don't determine whether you're going to hell or not, but I'll tell you what the Word says. You're living in sin, right? Because that's, that's a sin. But we're not pointing the finger because there's people in here that are probably living in some other sin that nobody knows about. Right? So, but if you continue in this willful way of life, then it separates you from God. And anything that's not in God is, right? Because he is love and he's life. And so I kind of gave it to them. And it's the truth. I didn't water it down or anything. But they kept coming. Six months later, one of them stopped coming. About a month later, the other one came up and said, I'm moving back home up north. And, uh, and I've left the lifestyle. Just from, because we allowed them to sit here. And I'm pointing this way because they sat right there every Sunday morning. Sit here, and and we loved on them. And they wanted to know about God and what God felt about their lifestyle. And I didn't tell them, oh, you're going to hell in a handbag. No, God loves you, and he wants you out of that lifestyle. Nobody here. Listen, (laughs) we could have brought them up front and said, "The, the one of you who has not sinned, throw the first stone. I'm writing a book about that. It's called The Assembly of One. Jesus had an assembly in the temple. You know that that whole situation happened in the temple. We think that because he rode in the ground, it was outside. It wasn't. This, was in, this, this adulterous woman was inside the temple. That's why they were going to stone her. She, was in, she didn't belong in there. And all the religious people were standing around with a rock in their hand. And Jesus said, those of you have... And then they all left. And what was left over? The adulterous woman and Jesus. The assembly of one in the temple. He chose her over all those other religious people to be in the temple with him. Incredible, right? We need to be loving even though we stand for what we believe, right? We stand for what we believe. Now I got to really get going. So uh, we stand on the side of marriage between a man and a woman. We always also want the message of love conveyed, even if we do not agree with someone's lifestyle, so that the gospel is given the opportunity yes. to be preached. Okay? We need to stand on the side of love. So, uh, you know, we're, we're called all kinds of things. Paul, in the book of Acts, wanted so badly to preach the gospel that he followed the customs of the law to enter the temple so he could tell them about Jesus. Now, I was going to read this, but I don't have time. I have already so many scriptures to read today. But in the book of Acts, we went through the book of Acts in our discipleship class, which happens on Wednesday, right after prayer from 7 to 8. That class, uh, we're going to have to move in here sooner or later because it's just getting so full back there. And it's really an awesome, awesome class. I don't teach. Uh, I facilitate the class. I sit down with the rest of them, and we all teach each other. Iron sharpens iron. Sometimes we even have a little spark here and there uh, uh, between Bruce and Mike. But the rest of us, the rest of us get along great. The rest of us get along. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There's a running joke about them too. But uh, you want to know about it? You got to show up Wednesday, right, Bruce? Yeah. You want to know about it? You got to show up Wednesday. It's just a running joke. It's not a big deal. Oh boy. Let me keep going. So Paul, we were going through the book of Acts, and we realized Paul wanted to get into the temple to preach the gospel in the temple. They were still living under the law. There were the works and the things that you had to do. And they told him, you can't come now. We found out something else, that Paul was not only a Jew, but he was also a Roman by citizenship, right? So like my wife is Brazilian, but she's an American citizen. So he was a Jew, but he was a Roman citizen. He paid a lot of money for that, it says. So he, he was both. So he had a lot of pull on both sides. So now he's standing at the door of the temple. He wants to come in. He wants to preach this gospel that's completely different than what they've heard, you know, for thousands of years. And they say, well, you can't come in until you purify yourself. You have to shave your head. You have to wash yourself and put on white clothing. And right. Those are all works. Now, if you wanted to go into a church to, to share a message that God sent you to do. And they stood outside and says, you got to go through this process. I don't believe in that. I'm not doing it. And Paul didn't do that. Paul shaved his head. Yeah. He washed himself. Yeah. And he put on that clothing, even though he didn't believe in the traditions and the laws that were being pushed into that church. Right. Now, he walks into the church and he brings the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. This is what happened to me on the road to Damascus. Right. He's sharing his testimony with them. He doesn't go against what they're teaching. But you know what they did? They went and they contacted the authorities and said, this guy's in the church and he's going against what we teach. He didn't go against what they were teaching. 
He didn't. He brought the gospel. He brought his message of what happened to him and how God changed his life. That's all our responsibility is. Not to stand against and argue what you believe. You know, if you're an atheist, the, the Bible says that if you don't believe in God, you're a fool. Well, you just lost that person. You just call that person a fool. They are not going to listen to any word you say after that. Right? I've led a couple of atheists to the Lord, too. <laughs> right? We've even done one Jehovah Witness. My wife and I have one Jehovah Witness under our belt. Right? But what do you do? you got to listen to them. Let them share what they believe or what they don't believe. And when you show interest and you ask questions and write, because this is who they are right now, and they want to be heard. Don't you want to be heard? We got the message of salvation. We got the greatest message ever. I want to be heard. One time I, was, uh, I had a telemarketer call. We were living in South Daytona. It was a Sunday after church. We were sitting there at the table, and, and he called. I picked up, and uh, he goes, can I have a couple of minutes of your time? And I was like, sure. And I said, only if I can have a couple of minutes of your time. And he said, okay. I said, who would you like to go first? Would you like to give your two minutes, or would you like? He goes, you can go first, he said. I said, okay. I said, it's Sunday. He says, yeah. I said, you're working. He says, yeah. I said, do you go to church? He goes, no, I used to as a kid. I said, oh, you have a wife? He says, yeah. You have kids? He says, yeah. I said, shouldn't you be home with them? And he kind of stayed quiet. I said, listen, I'm not here to give you a hard time. I'm here to tell you God loves you. He loves your family. He loves your wife and your kids. And he wants you as the father and the head of that household to be there with them. Right? And he wants you to Get up on Sunday morning and take them to a church that's going to teach you the love of God into your life. and into You don't want your children to grow up without having a spiritual uh, foundation of who God is and, and how much he loves them. And I said, I said, did you hear me? He says, yeah. And I said, go ahead. He goes, oh, never mind. He started crying on the phone, the telemarketer. And he goes, I'm quitting right now. I was like, oh, my God, this guy's going to quit his job because of me, you know. But he did. He did. He quit his job. I guess he did. He told me he was going to, but he was crying, so it looked sincere. But all I did was tell him that God loved him and wanted him home with his family, and, and, you know, and, and it worked. He went home. I don't know if after that he got saved or not or what, but if you ever hear a testimony of a telemarketer that said, I called this guy, <laughs> that was me. So in the midst of the world we're living in sin, God came and gave his life for us. Right? We need to stand for right life and not against sin. I stand for purity. I stand for holiness. I stand for righteousness. Right? The minute we start standing against sin, we're pointing a finger and we're sending everyone to hell and no one's going to listen to you. And if they do come into the kingdom, they're going to come out of fear of going to hell and not out of love for God. And the response is going to be different. Romans 5.8. But God, oh, by the way, in the, over the next three weeks, I got a three-week sermon on the harvest. I'm going to teach you all that. So that's why it's kind of fresh in my mind right now. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as you look out into the world and you go to these places and you see sinners and you see all these things, know that God died for them too. You are not more valuable than someone who is not walking in the way that you are. You're not, because God pray, paid the same price for everyone. Now, some of us choose to walk in the way, and we get benefits for that, right? If you, they're, they're, promises come with premises, right? You, you do something, and you, you give your tithes and your offerings, and there's a blessing that comes with that, right? You live a certain way, there's blessings. God's not a square trying to get you to live in this life, lifestyle where you're boring. No, he's trying to bless you. He's trying to bless you, and he's, he's made some ways to do that, and he's asking you to give him the opportunity to bless him. So every Sunday, we pray for those in leadership, kings, president. Um, we pray for those in high positions. And that's because of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And it says, first of all, then I urge the supplic that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who, or you can say for president, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. It's not enough that we do that here on Sunday morning. You should be praying for these people every day. 
This is good. And you should pray for me too every day. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I appointed a preacher... And an apostle, I'm telling the truth. Paul's saying, I, he, he's, a, he's appointed preacher and apostle. And then he has to tell him, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. You know how we quarrel? Listen, as Christians, we do it with the non-Christians. As Republicans, we do it with the Democrats. As liberals, we do it with the, right? Come on, we, we, we quarrel and we try to prove our point. Listen, you could be right and be so wrong. Right. Yeah. It's like marriage, men. When you're right, you're wrong. When you're wrong, you're wrong. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, brother. I think he's even visiting and he's amening me. Yeah. Right? He looks like he may have been married a long time. All right? So it's the same way. If you stand there and you prove yourself, look up Lee Strobel. He's, uh, uh, he wrote books on apologetics. You want to learn how to preach your gospel and defend God without offending other people? That's the man to do it. That's the guy that knows how to do it. He was a, a, a scientist, and he was trying to prove that there was no God. He was an atheist, married a Christian woman. That was his downfall right there. And he married a Christian woman. She started praying for him, and he realized after 40-something years of trying to scientifically prove that there was no God, that there was one, he gave himself to the Lord, and he began going to universities. He wrote a case for Christ, a case for God. You guys know those? those? Okay. So look him up, and he, I've read his books. I took a whole, uh, sem, uh, 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 a whole three months or four months of... Uh, um, of apologetics in college. So it's incredible. It really helps you. It's helped me tremendously in the times that I've had to speak to people who don't believe like I do. So there are three institutions. Here we go. There's three institutions in our world that God created. Family, pretty simple, right? Government and church. Now those are in our words. When we use the word government, our minds go somewhere because we have a government, right? But I'm going to explain to you in a minute uh, how that works. So number one, family. It's the foundation of society. It is the strong families that make strong churches. Strong churches don't make strong families. If you find a church that's strong, in the, like we have a strong children's ministry, right? Our ministry, we had uh, my brother and, and uh, his fiance were here last, last week. Was it last week? Man. I'm already losing track of time. So they were here, and they were like, you have so many kids in the church. I said, like, yeah, we were children's pastors for 15 years. That is, you know, we're, and, and you guys know what I mean by this. We're indoctrinating our children. Yes, we are. Because if we don't, they will. You're brainwashing your kids, they used to say to us. Absolutely, yeah. I don't know, I'm not going to argue with that. Yes, we are. All right? Washing with the word, right? Family. Genesis chapter 1. Now, you got to go to the beginning, right? Because that's where God in initiated these three institutions. Actually, the third one, church, is initiated in the New Testament. But number one, family, the foundation of society. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and, uh, and 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Be fruitful. So the, the couple became a family because they started having kids. And, you know, those first two kids were not very good, right? So, they, they, you know, one kills the other. It's, it's pretty bad. So, uh, you know, but they created and he tells them what their, what their job was, what their responsibility. Be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, we love that word subdue. It sounds like a, a, a military term almost. You know, you're going to go subdue. All it means is that what we believe and what I've created you for is going to take over the earth. Would, would that be such a bad thing? <laughs> Family was created in God's image to have dominion, to rule over, and to fill the earth. Number two is government. The protection of society. 
You know, they've, done, they've gone way beyond that line. Genesis chapter 9, verses 3 through 7 in the New International Version, it says, everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Lord, for pig, <laughs> for ribeyes. If you're married, you're welcome to join us today at 1 o'clock at my house for our married group. And uh, we have a, 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 we have, well, okay, sorry. The Pratts are bringing broccoli. So uh, she said it. I didn't say it. So I just repeated what she said from out there. But uh, anyway, we have a bacon-wrapped tenderloin that's going to be pretty amazing. And a taco salad, right? eight dip bean something. I don't know. Some of you are wishing you were married. So, But look, look. Here's one for the Pratts. Here's one for the Pratts. Just as I gave you the green plants... I now give you everything, but you must not eat meat that, is, that has its lifeblood still in it. No, you know, rare, I guess it's still dead, but, and for your, listen to this, and for your lifeblood, I will surely demand an account. I will demand an account for every animal and from each human being two, I, being Two, I will demand an account for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. Sounds like capital punishment. I almost feel uncomfortable reading it. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful. Here it is again. And increase in number, multiply on the earth, and increase upon it. Let me tell you, demand an account is one word in, in, uh, um, in the Hebrew. And it's darash, darach. It means to care for, diligently inquire, make inquisition, question, require, search, seek, and to watch over. To watch over. We also see a form of capital punishment in verse 6. Right? If a man sheds the blood of the other man. Now, uh, I was talking about this to Pastor Sean. Uh, sometimes I run my sermons by my, the pastors that oversee me. And he says, you know, the only problem with that is today's justice system is not 100% correct. And you could send somebody to death row and they didn't do anything, which he was right. He was right. That's why I said, wait till the end because it's, we're going we're gonna to give you a, a nice line to, to stay behind. So government was created to restrain evil, to protect the family and people, and to keep order. It was to protect. Government was made to protect. Three, church. The church's responsibility is to spread the gospel. Period. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. He tells them who he is and then how much authority he has. And then he gives them that authority by saying, Therefore, go, make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, in Acts chapter 2, we see the church being endued with power to fulfill this command that he gives them in, in Matthew. The church has been uh, has many other responsibilities, but to spread the gospel is the main purpose. And how do you do that? By teaching, by preaching, by bringing up your children in the way so that they could have something to share with other people, right? So next week, we're going to start a series on the gospel. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. So Christ himself gave apostles. This is so good. You guys are going to be blown away in a minute. So Christ himself gave, apo- gave Christ himself gave Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We call that in our uh, wording, we call it the fivefold ministry. To equip his people, to equip his people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Wow. Then... We will no longer be infants tossed to and fro by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and the deceitful scheming. The wind and the waves are blowing and going all the time. All the time. On your computer, on your, on your TV screen. You can go anywhere. If you, you can come up with your own doctrine. You think it's your own, fi- you know, 
Punch it in there. Somebody else will be preaching that same thing, no matter how off it is. 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love. Not speaking against lies in hate. Everybody's so quiet. Speaking the truth in love. Not speaking against lies in hate. But speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I I can't go into this. Uh, I I am writing something right now and I'm right in the middle of it. And, and I was just so moved. I, I broke down and, and everything while I was, I was sitting at my computer. The Lord said, we need to hand the church back to the head. See, the head provided these five-fold ministries to help him build up the church. And what's happened is we've taken this five-fold ministry and we've made it the head of the church. And that's not where we belong. We need to give the church back to to the head, right? He knows how to do things. Now, we're we're great at coming up with programs, and we have things that we do. We have outreaches. We do picnics. I'm not against all those things. But is Christ the head of the church wanting us to do that? And if he does, why does he want us to do it? How does he want us to do it? And what does he want us to preach while we're doing it? Because it's not just for us to, right? You, you want that kind of stuff, just go you know, uh, uh, join a, a country club. You get all kind of benefits. You pay you know, in, in whatever they decide that the money is, and, and you can go do that. But here, you're not a member so that the church can give you something. You're a member so that we can be part of a body that goes out there and preaches the gospel. We all do what, it, what is our part in the church. I can't stay. Man, I want to keep there, but uh, it's very important that we understand that. So each one of these institutions stands on its own with its own responsibility. Listen very carefully. The government has, was not given the assignment of raising your children. Right. I know this is going to mess some people up. We want to talk about the public school system, and we want to, you know, I can't believe what's happening over there, these people, and we, and we are in an uproar when we're in small groups and we want to say something, but then we don't vote. We don't vote for people that are going uh, to allow certain things to happen in these public school systems that are not going to try and indoctrinate our kids into the things of the world rather than to the things of God. Listen, if they're just teaching math, science, right, reading, and they're teaching the basic things and then they send the kids home, that's your responsibility to raise them up spiritually, right? right? Not theirs. Even Christian schools, it is not a Christian, even though you're, you might be paying a lot of money every month, you know, or, or, or you're homeschooling your child. If you're homeschooling, yeah, that's still your responsibility. So they're at home. Now you're teaching them math, science, and the things of God, right? So that's great. But don't put that on a Christian school either. Now, you have a better chance in a Christian school because they're going to teach everything according to biblical standards, which makes it easier for you to raise them right at home. But it's your responsibility. It is not the church's responsibility for your child's spiritual upbringing. It is not our responsibility. Imagine that. You take them out to eat once a week, and then they have to wait seven days to eat again. That no work. Right? That no work. You can't do that. It's your responsibility to pray with them, to read the word with them, to allow them to read the word and share with you what they're seeing in the word, even if it blows your mind and you're like, oh my God, I'm losing my child, right? You got to be able to have those conversations and be able to have that. It's your responsibility. Now, they can't protect innocent children, and we know that that's not happening entirely either, but they cannot raise your children. Our current government is attempting to indoctrinate our children against what God says in his word. And it is doing it in the name of protecting or in the name of freedom. I'm going to blow you away in a minute with freedom. The family is ultimately responsible for raising your children. Time to stand. It's time to vote. Time to make a peep. Right? Time to make a peep. Even if you've already raised your children, you got grandchildren, you got, come on. For yourself, or I don't want to go out in society and be overwhelmed with something that goes completely against what I believe with, believe about. Now, granted, my light will shine brighter in the darkness. 
right? But how do you make that light shine? We got to vote. We got to stand and vote for those. I'm going to teach you how to do that in a minute. God did not make the church to enforce the law. We're not here to enforce laws out there. Now, we vote for those who believe and can enforce the laws that go with our convictions. We do that. But we're not here to enforce the law. So there was a, a pastor in California of a large church, and they asked him, because the whole immigration thing, and they asked him, you know, what do you do if you know that you have illegal uh, uh, immigrants in your church? And he goes, oh, I'll tell you. He says, what? Absolutely nothing. It's not our job. It's not our job. It's the government's job. Now, whether you agree with that or don't agree with that, see, I can't find that here. Now, there are verses that support letting them in, and there are verses that support keeping them out. I'll tell you this. You guys are going to love this because, no, you know, uh, uh, usher, stand by the door. Don't let them out. <laughs> Tell you, hang out to the end. All the cities in the Old Testament were fortified by, thank you, I didn't have to say it. That word is like, can't say wall anymore, right? To, for their own protection. And there was a place, it's called the Eye of the Needle, there was a place where they allowed people in and out, in and out, in and out. And they did it legally and they did it right. Wherever you stand there, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not trying to put that on you. But you have to have a conviction and a knowledge of what you want to vote for and what you want out of your government. If that's what you're voting for, you missed it. If immigration is the only thing that's on your mind right now, that's what's the economy and immigration. Those are the two main things that our, our candidates are, are running for and against each other. The two main things. Let them bog themselves down with that because we, we, we're so far beyond that. We're so far beyond that. Right? You have no idea how un uncomfortable I am right now. <laughs> God did not give government the responsibility of bringing spiritual revival to our country. True. It's not up to our government. It's up to us. I understand that we have strayed from God's purpose for creating the three institutions. Our government has strayed from the farthest of the three. But uh, if the family and the church was fulfilling God's purpose in its entirety for its creation, then the government would not be so far off track. The man in the mirror. Although it may not be the church's responsibility to enforce laws, it is the Christian's responsibility to be involved in government. Okay? So you go Old Testament, you got kings and priests, right? They, they separated the two. If you were a king, right? But David was a man after God's own heart. And I know all the stuff he did. But read, read in the New Testament. God doesn't remember any of that stuff. Whenever he mentions David, he mentions a man after God's own heart. He doesn't mention adultery and murder. He doesn't mention any of that. He was not a good father. He didn't raise his family well. He didn't, right? But he was a man after God's own heart. How did he do that? He worshiped the Lord. He had a relationship. When his son was dying, he was mourning, wrapped in sackcloth, ashes on his head. He was going through the whole mourning process. The, 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 you know, the baby dies, the, the child dies, and he cleans himself up, and everybody looked at him and says, your child just died. He goes, him, I'll see you again. That was his, this guy had an understanding, yeah. and he was a king, and he was a king. Did he mess up? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely, but he was a king, and he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. Israel wanted a king, and they gave him, God gave him Saul, right? The the, the governments of those times were filled with the prophets. The kings would call the priests in, yes. call the prophets in, right? Now, they had other people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something in a minute. You guys are going to be like, what? They had other people that came in to, to help them and, yes. you know, uh, uh, witchcraft and this and that and the other. But yes. the prophets were, that's why in the morning when we pray for the United States every morning before service, when we pray, I always pray that the prophets in the house would rise up and yes. speak, right? Because they're still in the house. We need those people there. We say, oh, no, we don't, you know, we don't want Christianity in government and separate the two. And I'm going to explain that, that one in a minute, too. So, but we need to vote. So although we need to, uh, uh, Christians' responsibility is to be involved in government. Do you know the one thing that you can do if you're not in a, a politician 
is to vote. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 11 through 18. May the Lord, the God of our ancestors, increase you a thousand times and bless you as he has promised. But how can I bear your problems and your burdens and your disputes all by myself? Choose some wise, understanding, and respected men from each of your tribes, and I will set them over you. You answered, you choose, right? You answered me, what you propose to do is good. So I, I took the leading men of your tribes, wise and respected men. Wow, that's hard to find nowadays. Appointed them to have authority over you as commanders of thousands, of hundreds, of fifty of tens as tribal officials, president, senate, governors, mayors. Does that sound familiar? They're responsible for a, a smaller amount of people. And I charged your judges at that time, hear the disputes between your people and judge fairly. That's hard to find too nowadays. Whether the cases between two Israelites or between an Israelite and a foreigner residing among you. Seems like some... When migrated, do, do not show partiality in judging. Hear both small and great alike. Do not be afraid of anyone, for judgment belongs to God. Bring me any case too hard for you, and I will hear it. And that time I told you everything uh, you were to do. Come on, I, I don't think, do I have to explain that? It sounds like government to me. And like he was going to these tribes of of people who were Israelites that believed in God as the God of Israel and the God creator of the heaven and the earth. And he said, pick leaders from your tribes. You pick them and you put them in there. John Jay, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court on October 12, 1816 said this. Now, back then they would use, the, in government, they would use the word providence to say the word God. So he would say providence or God has given to our people the choice of their leaders. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation, 1816, not too long ago, to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. I'm just quoting John Jay. Now, prefer does not mean that Christian leaders are all going to be competent. I'm going to leave that one hanging there for a minute. So there may be some here who are watching online and be thinking, well, how about the separation of church and state? How is it that the church is supposed to get involved in, 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 right? And what we don't understand is that the separation of church and state does not appear in the Constitution at all. It was a letter written by Thomas Jefferson to a group of Baptists, okay? Now, so I get this right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, Okay. <laughs> The concept is enshrined in a very first freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, known as the Establishment Clause, the opening lines of the First Amendment. This prevents the government from creating or establishing a religion and thereby prevents the power of the government from expanding beyond civil matters. It seems like this law is more to control them than it is to control us. The First Amendment also protects people's rights to worship however they choose or not to worship, or, or not to worship any God at all. If, how many of you believe in freedom, right? We live in a country of freedom. We believe in freedom. Do you know that freedom is not just for us? Freedom is for those who live their lives in ways that you disagree. Absolutely. If we take the freedom away from those who have their parades and from those that do other things, we take their freedoms away, we lose ours. Exactly. And we have the greatest message that this world has ever heard yes. and will ever hear. Yes. And I refuse to shut up. I refuse to be quiet. I refuse not to share my Christ with someone. And I refuse not to be able to stand here and share what the Bible says. I refuse to do that. Come on. But the same freedom that gives us the right to do what we do gives them the right to do what they do. So the minute that you try to take away their freedom, you're taking away your own freedom to preach the gospel. I know. That's not what you want to hear, but that's the way it is. That's how freedom works. 
That's how freedom works. It's for both sides. This was to protect the church from the government's involvement in the establishment of religion, not to protect the government from allowing people of Christian faith not to hold offices in that level, at any level. This was not meant to keep people from separating their faith from their public life. Government officials should not separate their faith from their government responsibilities. Let's go back to vote. We determine the spiritual direction of our country by the leaders we vote for. By our vote, we get to choose the moral and spiritual direction of our country. The leaders we elect determine the policies we follow. Again, do not choose the lining of your pockets over the convictions of your heart. How do I vote? This is great. And uh, Paul is here. Good. How do I vote? Number one, is the candidate a Christian? I know. It sounds very like, oh, you're, you know, uh, uh, but like I said, wait to the end. Okay. One time I was preaching uh, here and I said something about people living together without being married and, and, you know, that they're living in sin. And I explained the whole fireplace thing. You guys have heard that. If you light a fire in a fireplace, it warms the room and it gives you, it's romantic. It's nice, right? Take that same fire, put it in the middle of the living room and it burns the house down, right? <laughs> right. So there's nothing wrong with the fire. Right. It's just where you have the fire, right? There's nothing wrong with sex, but it was created for between a man and a woman that are married right? I said that, and we had some people leave before they got to the end, and the whole message was about how much God loves them anyway, but they never made it. They never made it. I felt terrible, but I said, Lord, I'm doing what you call me to do, because that's what we believe, but God loves them anyway. Let them let come. Let them sit. Jesus sat there in the church with an adulterous woman. She wasn't saved. She wasn't leading worship. She was, she was an adulterous woman. And he was sitting there with her. He called it sin, though. Didn't he? Those of you who have never committed sin, because they were calling her sin, and he was calling her sin. But he says, if you haven't committed sin, throw your first stone. He didn't stop calling it what it was, but he loved on the sinner. Mm. Where am I? Is a candidate a Christian? This does not automatically qualify you to be an elected official. (laughs) Right? Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be president. I'll tell you what. I got enough gray hair as it is. We have had some Christian government leaders that were not competent. Yes. <laughs> some, of you, some of you have lived long enough to know what I'm talking about. But I'm not saying any names. I don't want to be disrespectful or derogatory towards anybody. But let's assume we have a competent Christian run. Assume. It's a big assumption. Let's assume that we have a competent Christian running for office. Why should I vote for them? Can I tell you that? Can I at least go there? Christians are more likely to enact godly principles than non-Christians. This does not mean that a non-Christian can enact a godly principle, but it's more likely that a non-Christian would not abandon a Christian belief because of poll numbers. I'm going to keep going. Christians experience the leading of God in their lives, don't we? Christians operate under a unique favor of God. Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. We've been groaning for a long time, (laughs) right? I'm tired of groaning. I want to rejoice, right? Come on. Let's vote right this time. Uh, Wow. You you guys are with me? Are you okay? Okay. I I know that sometimes when it goes too long, I start to lose you, but uh, just just hang with me, okay? Please. I'm, I'm asking for that favor. So, in 1980, how many of you voted in 19? I wasn't old enough to vote, okay? Thank you, but Pastor Dan. I know he doesn't, he doesn't mind when I pick on him. Were you in Kentucky when you voted? In 1980? No, you were already. Illinois, Illinois. So, in 1980, we got Jimmy Carter, Christian, Baptist man, raised in the church, married to one woman, teaches Sunday school. He taught Sunday school even through his presidency. All right, wonderful man of God. And we had Ronald Reagan, right? A, uh, 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 an actor on his second marriage, marriage. His wife was an astrologer, which 
hired other astrologers that together they would tell Reagan what to do during his candidacy. Do you know that Reagan won that by a landslide? The biggest uh, 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 victory in presidential history since 1938. He won by that much. Jimmy Carter lost. You know why? Because his policies lined up with biblical principles. You separated policy from personality, and we ended up with the person that was pushing towards, even though he may not have known that. Now, I tell you what, if I was able to vote back then, I probably would have voted for Jimmy, <laughs> right, as a Christian and all that. But that's why we must inform ourselves. I got quite a bit to go, but you can hang out there all you want, all you want, okay? <laughs> you, can, you can sit there and uh, you can play the national anthem, whatever you want to do. So, right? So <laughs> we got to learn to do that, right? And I'm not telling you what to do there. And I know that that sounds like I'm picking someone. Doesn't it? Okay, but I'm not. I'm just helping you. All right, number two. Do the candidate, where number one was be a Christian. Not all of them are, are the best candidate. Do the candidate's policies align with the Bible? Not every issue is a biblical issue. Right. Maybe a conviction issue for you, but it may not be a biblical issue. Some that are clearly defined in the Bible, all right, is sanctity of marriage. Yeah. Right? We don't want them changing laws according to the sanctity of marriage. The sanctity of life. God created male and female, and God cares about Israel. I'm going to explain that one in a minute. But for the sanctity of life, there's a big one coming up. It's it's the amendment for, I'm going to ask Paula to make her way up, and she's going to share something with you to help you make that decision. Guys, this is important, so don't be clock-eyed today, please. Good morning, New Life. I'm thankful for a church that speaks truth and does it from the pulpit. So um, Amendment 4 is going to be in our ballot, and I'm just going to focus on educating what it says, and then I do encourage you to do your own research too. Um, You can vote yes or no. If you vote yes, you are going to vote for legalizing abortion at any age, including minors, many in without parental consent, eliminating regulations on abortion, Um, and there's, it's an amendment with a lot of loopholes. So the name of the amendment is Amendment to Limit Government Interfering with Abortion. And this is the summary. No law shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability. Viability is not defined here. So it could be at any point from five weeks to 22 to 24 to 39. For the people that say that abortions don't happen on the third trimester, they do. Working on a pregnancy center, just want to let you know that a few weeks ago we had a girl that came in. She didn't know where she was. She was on her third trimester over 24 weeks. Um, We followed up with her the following week and she decided that she wanted to have an abortion left the state of Florida to have an abortion, late-term abortion. Usually they take two to three days. And we just, if you're part of the list, of our email list, you've received updates to pray for this mom. We followed up with her the day that she was going to have the procedure started. We spoke to her that morning just to tell her that we were there if she needed us for anything. And she said, I'm honestly having second thoughts. We encourage her to take time to learn about the procedure, to ask all the questions. She got to the abortion facility and then turned around. And she came back to Florida and decided to continue with her pregnancy and with our support. So they do happen, okay? So this says, NOLA shall prohibit, penalize, delay, or restrict abortion before viability. Viability is not defined. Or when necessary to protect the patient's health. Patient's health is not defined either. It could be mental stress. It could be morning sickness. It could be any of that. As determined by the patient's healthcare provider. Under Florida, there are over 58 healthcare providers. So we're talking about massage therapists. We're talking about dentists that, or even just people that work in clinics that provide abortion that are not 
directly medical providers. Um, this amendment does not change the legislature's constitutional authority to require notification to a parent. The legislature right now, it's consent. A parent needs to sign. This changes it to notification, and it's confirmed by how it starts. The no law shall prohibit, penalize, or delay. So if a minor goes and requests abortion or any women request, the law is going to say that abortion cannot be penalized, delayed, or restricted. Now, there is a lot of misinformation out there, so I just want to clarify. This email was sent by the health department, and it was sent on September 19th. Um, and it is the health department talking to all the healthcare providers saying that the law is clear uh, because there's so much misinformation, and this was it's regarding misinformation about abortions in Florida. The law is clear, abortion is permissible at any stage of pregnancy in Florida to save the life and health of the mother. Many probably heard that if this law is, is in Florida, lives are gonna be, mothers are gonna die because they're not gonna be able to receive health care. It is written and the, and the health care, the Department of Health is sending all of this. It says abortion is also available when the pregnancy results from rape, incest, or human trafficking, or has a, um, fatal fetal abnormality. One more time, healthcare facilities and providers must be aware that a, phys a physician providing life-saving treatments for pregnant women does not violate Florida law and that failure to do so may constitute malpractice. Additionally, um, it says providers are reminded that Florida requires life-saving medical care for a mother without delay when necessary. So just make sure you do the reading, make sure you understand what you're voting for. And just to finish, there's a verse that has been in my heart and I just want to read it because I know that while we vote, we are also voting for the generations that are coming. So I want to make wise decisions, not only for me, but for my children, for my grandchildren. And if Amendment 4 passes, this becomes a part of the Constitution in Florida. So all the years of work to protect life are going to be done and Florida is going to become the capital of abortions with laws that are more liberal and more open than California. So in, I cannot say this, and I know I, I speak kind of good English, Deuteronomy, do you guys, De Deuteronomio. <laughs> um, 19, it says, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Let us choose life, not because of how we feel or who we like, but because we love our generations. And every human life has been created by God and deserves a chance to fulfill its purpose. No, oh, thank you so much. If for no other reason, vote life. If for no other reason, for a child's life. I don't know if any of the pregnancy centers have these, but um, I was on the board of Coastal Choices for a couple of years. And, you know, to get you ready for what you're getting involved in, they show you a video of an actual abortion. And I'm sorry if this sounds graphic, but when you see arms and legs, yeah. man, I don't know how any human being could do that to another human being. To me, it's like, right? Do the candidate's policies align with the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life? God created male and female, and God, and God cares for Israel. There's your four biblical reasons. Now, the other ones, you can find scriptures and things that kind of align there and help you. But, and then number three is, what is the candidate's view on Israel? Now, you would think, I've never thought of that. I've never uh, uh, voted for someone because they were for or against Israel. However our nation decides to treat Israel determines whether we experience God's blessing. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, Israel. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, 
And I will curse him who curses you. And in all you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. History proves this over and over again. Come on. Think about it. The nations that rose against Israel back in those times. We're not going to talk about modern time, but back the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the termites. I just added those because I wanted to add ites in there, right? I got a little too serious, so I wanted to add the termites. This nation, no, these nations no longer exist. Number four, will the candidate get things done? So this is the one you don't sacrifice for the rest, but you need this one to be part of the rest, right? Because they could say a lot of things and then end up in office and not do anything. First Timothy chapter two, verses one and two. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that they may lead a peaceable and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. In my own words, the government should keep us safe from evildoers and leave us alone to practice our faith. Yes. Amen. We need to learn to separate policy from personality, and I explained that earlier using as an example the 1980s. So these four questions are subjective, (laughs) but hopefully they will give you a guideline as you vote. How do you make a difference? Participate in the process. The travesty that 50% of Christians don't vote. That's got to end. You may not like either candidate, but you will never have a perfect choice. I'm going to give you a quote. I'm going to tell you what the quote means, then I'll tell you who said it. Don't let the best keep you from doing good. Prioritize progress over perfection. So I kind of changed it. Don't let the best keep you from doing Like you want the best but it keeps you from doing good, right? Don't let the best keep you from doing good. Obama. Never thought I'd quote him from here, did you? (laughs) Evil triumphs when Christians do nothing. Vote. You got military personnel here that have gone. They've been in battle. We've got family members here that have lost people in battle fighting for our freedom to vote and we don't want to go out on a tuesday morning and go to a place and stand in line for a few minutes and and vote that is ridiculous that is that is just i don't understand that it's absurd to me that people would give their lives and fight for our freedoms and then we don't even take advantage of that freedom participate 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 vote on facts not rumors Vote on facts, not rumors. Social media, AI. You notice how now they're putting people there. and they, You can tell that it's not their face or their mouth moving and they add the words to it or whatever. The NFL is going crazy with it right now. Yeah. Social media, AI. The ability to deceive people is greater today than it yes, ever has yes. been in any time yes, of history. Verify, verify, verify. There's a lot of nonpartisan news and a lot of things that you can go out there i'm going to recommend one uh it's um uh billy graham evangelical association they have a nonpartisan voters you know uh, the reason i used to put them out we used to get them and put them out here and then and then there was somebody on there that somebody voted for and then they switched at the last minute and they ended up passing laws that really messed up our community and i was like i I support not that i supported that person but i put him out there as one that fell on one side and he was actually on the other so i don't want to the church is not to be involved in that but i do want to i want to show you how to do this right so vote on facts not rumors and trust in god's sovereignty no matter who ends up there We need to pray for that person. And no matter who ends up there, God can use them. Read your Bible, people. But as we trust in God's sovereignty, it doesn't mean that we do nothing. Because we do everything within our ability, and then everything else is up to Him. Right? We do everything in our ability, and that is vote. Vote and vote and vote. I'm going to end with this. Charles Colson 
Chuck Colson, said this. Listen very carefully. Ask, as the citizens of the kingdom of God, Christians are to bring God's standards of righteousness and justice to bear on the kingdoms of this world. And what is sometimes called the cultural commission, among other things, this means bringing trans transcendent moral values into public debate. The popular notion that you can't legislate morality. How many of you have ever heard that? You can't legislate morality is a myth. I believe that. Listen, morality is legislated every day from the vantage point of one value system being chosen over another. Listen to the last part of this. The question is not whether we will legislate morality, but whose morality gets legislated. They will gather, they will make laws, they will try to pass laws, and they will do them according to what they think is right in their own eyes. Come on, read your Bible. Writing, they, the people did what was right in their own eyes, and they were so morally off. Right? We need to go to God. He's the only real moral righteous that, right? We, we, our governments want to determine what morality and integrity is. Man cannot determine that because we are immoral and we don't, right? Yeah. Come on. No matter how righteous we try to be and how good we try to be, we miss the mark. Only he is perfect. Yes. Only he can determine what that is. Yes. But we have an opportunity coming up. If for nothing else... If you heard nothing else today, take what Paula told you. Yes. If for nothing else, just with that alone should help you to vote. Yes. Just that alone. But there's so many other things in play here. And I don't want to be one that, you know, I'm not a bad news kind of guy. I'm a good news. I'm not a, what do they call it, a pessimist. My cup's always half full. But I will say this. If we don't start doing something, Starting this election. If we don't vote, even no matter who ends up there, if we don't go out as church and as Christians and as people who believe in the Bible and God and have conviction, if we don't go out and vote, we're going to take another step in the wrong direction. Yes. And we're right on the verge of darkness. I don't know about you, but I got grandkids. I raised my kids. I have grandkids, great grandkids. We had, right? Come on. If for nothing else. Nothing else. We need to make a sound. How do you make that sound? We're not going to stand out there against something. We're going to stand for what we believe. How are you going to do that? You're going to go out and vote. You're going to go out and vote. You're going to go out and vote. And don't take my word for it. Verify, verify, verify. Forget all that other stuff online. Even the, even the debates, man, it's so hard to watch. It's so hard to watch. And uh, I, I voted on several presidencies. I'm only 57, but I voted on several. And there were times where I voted for the best of the worst. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, those of you who vote know what I'm talking about. You vote for the best of the worst. Yeah. Come on, we have an opportunity that we can. I, I don't know about you, man, but I could see that both, uh, th there's no intermingling of the two sides here this time. It's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. I had written here Amendment 3. How many of you know what that is? Yeah. Verify, verify, verify. They're using the fact that marijuana is illegal and that they're, they're, they're putting all this stuff in it. People are dying, that there's all this illegal stuff going on, right? They did it with alcohol many, many, many years ago, right? They're going through that whole process. Do you know who's paying for all those commercials and for all those people promoting this? It's a company or a couple companies out of Canada. Verify. I didn't, I, nobody told me this. I verified. They grow most of our, uh, 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 you know, government marijuana has grown. And most of our pharmaceuticals come out of Canada. You didn't know? Did you guys know that? That's why there's so much money up there. <laughs> we're, we're they're making them and we're taking them. And these companies want to monopolize this so that they can make money no matter what it does to our community. You determine what it's going to do to your community. I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you what to vote there. But verify. Find out. Find out. 
It's very simple. History. How many of you like history? I'm not a history guy, but right? That's why I'm against socialism and communism because my mom left and my dad left Cuba in the midst of communism coming in. And what communism has done to that country over the last 50 years, just it's all you got to do is see it. Venezuela. Come on. These countries are, are being raped is what the only word I can come up with. Because of, of this greedy, greediness and the, these corrupt governments. Inform yourself. Now, as far as Amendment 4 is concerned, that's easy. Vote no. Vote no. You don't even have to listen. If you go in there and go, I wonder, just say, Pastor Rick said no. If that's the only reason why you do it, that's fine, but vote no. Right? Vote no on that. And even in, in our, our state, we have, uh, oh my Lord. I don't want to, I can't, I can't do that. Even in our state, right, we have, we have to vote for the best of the worst. And we have one that, that's going to continue to push certain things. One of those is the sanctity of life. And there's another one that is not. And on the, on the, on the basis of freedom, right, we want to give our women their freedom. Man. If you get an opportunity, you got to watch one of those, uh, uh, one of those videos. It's not a blob in there. There's a human being in there. According to the Bible, that human becomes a human at the moment of conception. Yes, yes. Biblically, at the moment of conception. And even before conception, God has already written. Yes. Come on, when you were here about, I, I taught on purpose. God has already written that person's life, and it was snatched and taken. Who could that person have become? The next Billy Graham? right come on the next whatever next yeah it could have come up with, well they, i think they've come up with that stay out of conspiracy theories that's another one stay out of those things man stay out of those what people say is happening what's not happening the truth is the truth it's very simple the new generation says that's your truth that doesn't exist it's either truth or it's not it is or it's not. It can't be your truth and then my truth and they're against each other. Then it's not truth. Yeah. Let's find the truth. Sometimes it's hard to do that. Let's stand to our feet this morning. I want to pray over you. And, uh, uh, and I, you have no idea how excited I am that this is over. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm standing before you this morning in complete and total obedience yeah. as your pastor. You did great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next week, we start a series on, on I'm, I'm an evangelist in a pastor's uh, uh, skin, you know, because I, I love the lost. And next week, we're going to start a, a two, possibly three-part series as we head into, you know, the, uh, this is harvest season in the natural and the spiritual. As we head out of summer and into the fall, it's harvest season. And we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm going to use something I've used before on the second or third uh, uh, part of the series and we're going to use a combine. You guys know what a combine is? And we're going to use the manual for a combine. And it tells you the steps to use. It's a pocket manual for the combine. And each step fits a spiritual truth about the harvest. And you don't want to miss that. That's, I, I love that part. But uh, we're going to be talking about the harvest over the next two to three weeks. And it's going to help us as a church as we do outreaches now or coming up. A harvest picnic. Uh, Christmas parade. We give out hot dogs out here. We have the Christmas toy drive. We have a Thanksgiving uh, 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 drive. That's going to happen. I believe it starts on the 20th of this month. I'll mention it a week before so we can start bringing food in. Uh, we're going to be uh, distributing that food through our two pregnancy centers and a little bit is going to go towards Orange City Elementary. Uh, but we want to uh, support those families uh, that are coming in for help and, and get them a turkey and food and all that. So uh, we have a lot of opportunities now to bless our community and to do what our vision says, right? We want to uh, reach the lost that they would know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. And, uh, and community reaches harvest. If we have a community mind outside these four walls, we'll reach the lost that's out there. So let's do that. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Father. I pray, Lord, that we would remove our mind our thoughts, our intelligence even from some of this, Lord, and that we would seek you and your Holy Spirit's leading, Father, 
to be able to make these choices that are going to determine the future of our city, our state, and our, our, our uh, country, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to make those decisions, Lord, that you would help us. You Only you know the future, Lord. Only you know uh, what needs to happen, Father. But we're going to do our part, and then we're just going to wait on you to do yours, and you always do. Lord, you always do what you said you would do, Father. So we love you. We praise you. I thank you for your wisdom. I pray for wisdom that falls upon our people. And more importantly, a peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our heart and our mind. Guard our heart and our mind from social media, from the news, from fear, from doubt, from all that stuff that happens during this time, Lord. We stand on your word. We, having done all, we stand on your word and because of that we have peace in our lives in our homes and in our families in the powerful name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen if you're ever in the central florida area consider this a standing invitation for you to join us we would love to meet you services are sundays at 10 30 a.m and wednesdays at 7 p.m if this message blessed you imagine what it would be like in person keep up with everything going on at new life on our website orangecitychurch.com, New Life Bible Church. You will never be the same.